just for fun, here are some of my focus stacking rules of the road. Now in general, but not always, Here's my recipe, my personal recipe for stacking macro nature shots. And I'm going to include the obvious and the not so obvious. Number one, what I call first light. I try to get both the dim early light, you know, the first rays, and then as the sun rises, what I can. So I'm out there before dawn. As the sun comes up, I move to more shadowy areas as the sun takes over. Sunlight, except in small shafts, is too bright for my taste, so I use diffusers. I carry diffusers, and the most used diffuser is my own body, often, between the subject and the sun. Second, cold. Cold is good, you know, cold by cold, I mean early morning cold in the summertime. It's good for a couple of things. For one, it slows the critters down a bit, and it gives me a chance to stack photos. Second, it causes dew to be present, which is great on plants, but not always so good on live things. Another point that I make is go slow. I move slowly around critters, and I try not to cast shadows over them unless the shadow is very, very slow moving. I take my time. I'm in no hurry with my photog photography because there's really nothing in particular I'm looking for and now for some special pearls of wisdom upon which no price can be put. What I call found photos. I stopped looking for photos and looking for animals or critters a long time ago. You know, stalking the wild, whatever. Um, but what I also call gotcha photography, you know, to sneak up on something and get a photo of them. Expectations of any kind are never the friend of this photographer. I'm not, a, I'm not a stalker. I've been there, I've done that, and as a kid, I think I mentioned in another video that uh, I collected butterflies and snakes, turtles, li lizards and salamanders, and just everything. So I did my stalking, I did my hunting, and I did my finding. Instead, today, I wander through nature until I am struck by the beauty of a shot. And that's the one that I take. And I pass up the, the low-hanging fruit, as they say, even if it's a rare critter, if I don't feel like it, if it's not beautiful to me, even if it's rare and special. Well, maybe I'll take a shot or two of the super rare ones. But in other words, I wait for something to strike me with its beauty, and then I photograph. Breathing. Be sure to breathe. I breathe in that fresh early morning air. I feel the invigorating cold and I am refreshed from it. As for, as for light, um, as mentioned earlier, I delight in that pre-dawn and dawn light and sometimes in the evening if I'm not too tired. I invite it, you know, I celebrate it. I'm out there all alone and the natural world is just waking up. What about live things, what I call critters? In my own way, I wish that all critters might be happy and not suffer. Most of their lives are very short. As the great Tibetan Lama Chugyam Trungpa once said to a group of audiences, this is how he began a talk, which I think is pretty funny, some of us will die very soon, the others just a little later. So this, uh, it helps for me to reflect that I too am a critter. Gratefulness is another thing. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be out in this very fresh morning. And I wish that every photographer and every human being could experience this as well. And last but not least, I do something what I, which is what I call mixing, and it's a little harder to explain, but I mix my photography with my meditation. Um, so maybe I should say a few things about how I view photography. I started photographing close up when I was about 16 years old, 15 or 16. I had been a naturalist since I was six. 
and a serious naturalist at that. But by my teens, I had learned a, a great deal about nature. And my main focus was herpetology, in particular, the study of salamanders. Of course, by that time, I knew and loved about every critter that could be found in the meadows and woods where I live. I mean, I still feel that way. Loving all humans has been a little, or loving humans in general has been a little more difficult for me, but animals, easy. Anyway, by my teens, I was taking nature photos that were, I'm told, very good. Then somewhere around there, I discovered girls and my interest in nature was put on the back burner for a decade or so. What follows here is more or less where I am now, how I go about photographing these, day, these days and, and not something, not the long journey of how I got here. I'm, I'm not a gotcha photographer. My, my interest, interest in chasing down critters and capturing their photos has passed. I did that and never fully liked it too well, even at best. And gradually that whole kind of gotcha photography lost interest for me. It was too much like taking snapshots just because I could and not because I wanted to or that the subject was beautiful or awesome or interesting to me. Today you could perhaps call me a photographer of found objects, found subjects things that I just come across when I take my camera out into the woods or garden. And for something to be found in my eyes, it has to appear beautiful to me. Notice I said to me and not to you, taking pictures for others as a primary motivation, obviously it's good for professional photographers, but I have no intention of making money from photography. First of all, it's hard to do. I do photography only for the beauty of it. So beauty is my main motivation. Years ago, if I came across a scene or an animal that was remarkable, I would photograph it. But looking at these shots later, they seem to be just snapshots of something I didn't really care about. So these years I walk on by unless I'm struck by the natural beauty of what I'm seeing. Only then will I photograph it. I may be looking at a beautiful flower, but unless I can see the beauty right there, right in the here and the now, unless I'm really moved by it, I no longer will photograph it. I have too many photographs like that. They're just like photographs, and that's not what I'm looking for. And I have to relax when I go out photographing. My day-to-day -day job, and yes, I, I still work a full-time job at 71 years old, it's busy enough to distract me from what's really important in life. So just walking outside with a camera in my hand does not equal good photos. I have to unwind. It takes me time to relax and time to open my eyes to what's sublime. There are days that I can walk for a very long time before seeing anything worth photographing. And what's that about? That's about the state of my mind. And then there are other times where everywhere I look, it's incredibly beautiful. Does this tell me something? Sure it does. It tells me that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and that what we see out there in the wilds, in nature, is simply a projection of our own state of mind on the screen of whatever we're looking at. We, we might like to think that photography is all about technique, how we manipulate our equipment, or about having the best camera bodies, the best lenses and filters and tripods, things like that. And it's certainly true that good equipment and proper technique is important, it's worth having. But using equipment depends on the mind, and it depends most of all on the motivation behind it. In some area of our life, most of us know that having the best equipment does not guarantee that we know or that we care how to use it, much less that we can get what we would call good results. So while we can talk about lenses and technique and all of that, this alone will not promise us good pictures. So what, what, what does then? Good photo technique 
well, first of all, we've got to learn it, but, but we, it will never be acquired unless we have the proper motivation. The intense interest and the, and the drive to keep at it long enough to build solid technique that will work for us. We can't just fake it or wish it so. The practice or habit forming part of any discipline like photography is a vast desert that can only be crossed with intense interest, with love, and with passion for the subject. You will never get across the habit forming practice needed to take good fo photos just because you want to, or because it would be nice for others if you could do this or that for them. It, it will never happen. So what is proper motivation? Proper motivation differs for each of us. What it takes to inspire us to do enough photography to master some part of it is where, that we, where we can agree to differ. And it's also where we find our differences. In other words, there are many roads to Rome, but we have to follow one of them to the end to get there. So it can be important to pick an approach that's going to work for us and not assume that what works for others will also work for us. Wanting to take good pictures is, in my opinion, not enough of a reason to bring forth the inspiration to actually acquire the necessary technique. Taking good photos has to be more personal than that. It has to fulfill or complete something inside of us. It has to stand between ourself today and what we will become, what we could call our future self. It has to be a road that we must walk. We must need to do photography as part of learning to know ourselves. Anyway, there are probably as many reasons as there are people, but the path to good photography so that we are really satisfied involves discovering or satisfying some itch deep within us. Otherwise, we just won't keep at it long enough to become satisfied with what we produce and to get good at it. We can't do it just to get more attention from others. That's too weak a motive. We have to do it for ourselves because we have to do it, because it completes us. We have to love it. It's not as if there's a choice or, or there's another way or another road that we can take. The road is obvious and we don't have to remind ourselves to do it. And the reason for that is because we can't wait to do it.